Um, so good afternoon and um, I'd like to take you 200 years into the future from where you've been for the last hour um, because we'll be talking about contemporary Australian small presses. I'm joining you from the unceded lands of the Jagera and Turbal people. My field of study is small presses and how they contribute to social change and for me small presses sit at the intersection of publishing art and politics and their continued existence and success brings me joy and hope that publishing can be an effective force for good in the world, which is how I believe it fits in with this conference. I've been researching and interviewing small presses over the last year and the issue of definitions or what makes a small press is particularly vexed. In this presentation, I'll give a quick overview of the elements which have traditionally defined small presses and then I'll give my suggestions for a philosophical or trait-based definition. I believe this will bring us closer to understanding the true nature or quiddity of small presses. I will then present an example of a small press from my research, which I believe embodies this philosophical definition and shows its validity. In terms of the terminology I'll be using, no doubt you will have heard of small presses and independent presses. You have probably or possibly even heard of micro, pico and nano presses as publishing houses get tinier and tinier and perhaps terminology like boutique or niche publishers when they focus on very specific areas. For today, I'll be talking about small presses as one term which broadly encompasses those other categories. Excuse me while I work out how to work my slides and talk to you at the same time. Can you see the next slide now? What definitions have been used so far? Is that the right one? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tully. Um, so what I've seen used in scholarly and industry publications, there's three kinds. The first is that small presses are like love. You know exactly what it is when you see it and you don't even need to talk about a definition. The second kind is defining small presses in terms of what they are not, in that they are clearly not large publishing houses because we all know what that means and they are also not owned by multinational conglomerates. The problem with these non-definitions is that they are non-definitive and they don't actually limit themselves or explain what a small press is. The third kind of small press definition tends to take a more statistical or metric approach. So we will get a business's annual turnover, the number of titles in the backlist, the number of authors in a press's stable, the number of people on staff, the number of titles published each year, number of copies in the first print run, whether author fees are paid or not, and how the press is owned and by whom. Now, the three points related to authors, author fees and ownership are all designed to rule out vanity presses and self-publishing. Unfortunately, there is no clear agreement on any single one of these terms. So for example, I have seen used in industry and scholarly publications that a small press could publish less than five, less than 10, or less than 20 titles per year. Likewise, turnover can be less than 50,000, less than 500,000, or less than $10 million per year for a small press. And there's quite a range of difference in those numbers. So because it's so varied, it makes it really difficult to compare the work or practices of different small publishers on the basis that somebody has declared them to be small. So given that these aren't useful, what can we use instead? What I'm proposing and what I have tried to do is offer a process of comparison and extraction where I look at five different sectors of publishing for the sake of this presentation. And from each of those kinds of publishing, I select a trait which illuminates the behaviour of small presses and take that as an element in the philosophical definition of what a small press is. So the first one here is obviously the big five, which is soon to be the big four, given that Penguin Random House will soon be the owner of Simon & Schuster. We know that unfortunately, the big five often treat their writers and their books as commodities. But in small press world, nothing could be further from the truth. 
I have never come across a small press which uses the word product to talk about its books. Instead, what small presses emphasise is the quality of their output in terms of production values, editorial work and the writing which they choose to publish. The second kind of publishing I looked at was movement and activist presses. So what this is, is the iconic cover image of Joanna Russ's How to Suppress Women's Writing. This was issued in 1983 by the Women's Press in the UK. And what movement presses and small presses often have in common is a strong or even overriding sense of mission. So the mission of that small press may be that it is publishing feminist writers, that it is promoting creators with disabilities, or that it is seeking out literary experiments, but it is the mission which is at the heart of the press's work. Next is the artist's book. This image here is called Signs of the Resistance by Taylor Cox. And there are three things we can learn from artists' books that will help us understand small presses. The first is the willingness to experiment, explore and take risks. Small presses habitually take financial and editorial, editorial risks that larger and more commercial publishers simply will not take. The next is passion. Artists like small press publishers and many book people are driven by passion because it won't be the money that gets them to the end of the project, it will be the love. And the third one is beauty. Artist books often play with the beauty of their medium to make a dramatic statement. And the small press publishers that I spoke with were inordinately proud of how beautiful their covers were and what a beautiful book they had at the end of their day's work. The next one we're looking at is the community-based publisher, which here I've chosen to use a cartonera publisher. I don't know if you can see from the image, this, but this is bound in cardboard. The book block is stitched and then glued into cardboard covers using a strip of fabric, which is that green thing on the left. And the covers are all individually painted at an outdoor all age workshop. I was at the workshop where this book was made, which was part of the work of La Cartonera Cuernavaca, which is in the city of Cuernavaca in Mexico. This book is about the stories of local fighters in the Mexican Revolution in 1910. So fighters around the Cuernavaca area. So what community presses can teach us about small presses is the centrality of relationships. Without connections between the writer, the publisher, the bookseller, the bookmaker, the distributor, there is no way that a cartonera book could exist. And likewise, small presses focus a lot of their attention on creating and maintaining and strengthening their relationships in order to get their books out into the world. The second is service. And I'm gonna read a quote here, which is by Jeff Schotts, who is the editor of Grey Wolf Press in Minneapolis. He says that the editor or publisher is in service to the writer. The editor and the writer are in service to the book. The book is in service to an entire community. And so it often is with the work of small press. And finally, voice. Community publishing and many small presses actively choose to publish local, silenced, neglected or unusual voices and they are choosing that to bring them into the public sphere. And then next, I've chosen the fine press sector. You can see I've got an image here which is the opening page of Genesis from the Doves Press Bible, 1902 to 1904. Fine presses, like many small presses, put their effort into producing a physical material codex. Now it is true that many small presses integrate audio and eBooks into their production cycles, but the love of the publisher, from my experience, is directed at that physical item at the codex itself. Second is the issue of difficulty. It is not easy to be a publisher. It is not easy to stay a publisher. It is expensive, it is complex, and even at the best of times, trade publishing only makes 10% profit. Both fine presses and small presses are willing to keep making books even in the face of this perpetual difficulty. And third is the issue of time, which in fact teaches us two things. One is that both fine presses and small presses invest significant time into the production of the books. And they invest that amount of time because they expect their book to be around for a long time. They put the time in in order to develop a good enough item and a good enough book that it will be around and have an influence for a very long time period. 
So this is the summary of traits that we've just extracted. A small press is committed to books and authors not being a commodity, to quality, to mission, to experimentation, passion, beauty, relationships, service, voice, materiality, difficulty, and time. And I'd like to provide an example of a press which I believe embodies the, this definition and give, by using a trait-based definition, it gives us a much clearer idea of who this press is and the kind of role it plays in the bibliosphere. So the press that I've chosen is the Wild Dingo Press, which is based in Melbourne. It was, I interviewed two staff at this press in my research this year. It was founded by Catherine Lewis in 2010 and it has 36 titles in print. It shares, quote, the rich cultural output and traditions of those oft discussed but denied a voice, end quote, and it also gives control over representation back to the people affected. Its tagline, as you can see from the logo, is books that stand their ground. On staff... Five, five minutes left. Thanks, Tally. On staff, it has one full-time person who is the owner and publisher. It has one part-time person who does promotions. It has a part-time bookkeeper, and sometimes they can hire a publicist. Given the size of this press, we need to look at the amount of success they have had, which is quite extraordinary for such a small publishing house. Catherine's first book was The Rug Maker of Mazari Sharif, which she issued first in 2008 and then again in 2010. This was the story of an Afghan refugee who came to Australia and was held in Woomera Detention Centre. That book sold 40,000 copies. It was put on the BCE list and it was widely read and purchased, particularly in the southern states. Another amazing success they have had is that this year one of their titles was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize. That was The Enlightenment of the Green Gage Tree, which was written originally in Persian and translated from the Persian by an anonymous translator. The author is Shokofer Azar. I dare say there are very few presses in Australia, let alone a press that has less than two people on staff, which has produced such a success story for that one. Now I'd like to give the final word of my presentation to the owner and publisher of Wild Dingo Press, as I believe her words embody so many of the defining traits of small presses as we extracted them earlier. It's my passion to give voice to the disenfranchised and the disempowered and those who would be silenced. It's 100% that, it always has been. And a book is not just a sausage or a loaf of bread. Oops. Oh no, it, it needs to be sort of sacralised, you know. It's like a sacred thing to me. Publishing is like a sacred duty. Are there any questions? Wow, what a fantastic presentation. Just absolutely wonderful stuff there. Um, yeah, so much, so much to think about. And it was really great to have that jump from 200 years ago into the contemporary moment to think about how these things, um, you know, operate across across time, across spaces, um, to think uh, a little bit globally as well about how small presses connect to the world. Um, yeah, all sorts of brilliant ideas there. Are there any questions from our audience? So someone has said, given your list of traits, they say, great paper, Jody. Um, given your list of traits, I'm wondering whether small press is the best term. They are usually small, but is that a necessary condition? Says Gillian. I know, I spoke to two presses in my research. That was due to the limitations of COVID that it was so few presses in the end, but I also spoke to some of their authors. And I know that Definitely one of those publishing houses was absolutely explicit in saying it's vital we remain small in order to be able to focus on what we want to achieve and not give ourselves too big a publishing list and not expend too much time and effort on too many titles and too many authors, essentially coming back to the limitations of the checkbook, but also the limitations of the relationships, like how many relationships can they actively maintain in terms of getting a bigger staff and getting a bigger author pool. Um, I don't know if they need to be small inherently in order to 
comply with that list of traits. And I also have others, by the way. I just had a, did a count and I worked out that I had a, I'd done analysis based on about 15 different publishing sectors. So I've got probably 25 traits on my list here at the side. Um, I must say I would be hard pressed to find something bigger than a small publishing house which could maintain that level of ethics <laughs> because then the profit motive gains more power and it's much harder to keep everybody on mission essentially like if you've got people on if you've got po people focused on making a good product to get it to market to make the profit then it's really hard to serve the twin gods of mission and profit I would say, and I think maybe size is the dividing line between those two. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, another question asks, do you include university presses within your small press definition? Where do you see them sitting? It's interesting because I did use them as a comparison. I did use academic presses as a comparison. And I thought about that in terms of prestige and in terms of seeking the exact right audience for the product, which is also something that small presses do. They often, it's interesting, isn't it? Because they often do have enough of a mission drive and enough of that focus to function according to that basic definition. And in terms of the integrity and the quality of their work, they quite often do fit in as well as fitting in with the metric definitions of, you know, very small numbers and small title output, et cetera. So yes, quite possibly they do fit in with that definition, yes. 